Seth Belazarian from Pantucket Medical Associates here on Haverhill Community Television for segment two. We're talking about broken heart syndrome and I'm here with my associate Dr. Sunny Srivastava to review this topic which is something that we see not infrequently. It uh, happens on average once every week or every other week in our community. Uh, this is a, a problem that's just been recognized in the last decade. We're increasingly understanding how to recognize it and how to treat it. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Sunny to give us some input about it. Great, thanks. So, you know, this topic seems to come up in the press anyhow every year around Valentine's Day. It, a lot of articles, a lot of um, stories in the news, and so I get a lot of people asking about it, and so it just makes me want to talk about it more, because I have, just like you said, seen more and more people with it. Even in the past few months, a handful of people I've seen with it, um, and so it, it's always nice to talk about it. And there's a lot of different names for it. One name, I think the most easy to recognize or commonly um, used name is broken heart syndrome, especially amongst the lay press. Um, the name that I think is used most in the medical community is Takatsubo cardiomyopathy, and that's a Japanese term. A Takatsubo uh, is an octopus pot. And the reason why it's called that is that the heart actually looks like an octopus pot, a pot that's used in Japan to catch octopi. Um, and, um, and that's where the name comes from. It was first described in Japan in 1990, but really did not get recognized here in the U.S. until, as you said, 10 to 15 years ago. Um, and it is a um, not uncommon event. Of all folks presenting to the emergency room or hospital with what looks like a heart attack, a certain type of heart attack, close to 2 to 3% of them turn out to be this broken heart syndrome or Takatsubo cardiomyopathy. Um, it's an interesting demographic as well. Um, a large proportion of them tend to be either Asian or Caucasian. We don't see it in the African uh, population as much or um, the Latin population as much. And the vast majority uh, tend to be in postmenopausal women. More than 90% are in postmenopausal women. Um, lots of theories as to why that may or may be, but no definitive concrete evidence. And, and, and what broken heart syndrome is, or Takatsubo cardiomyopathy is, um, it's a, a syndrome where typically there is some emotional stressor that sets it off. Um, some common examples are uh, people walking into a room and finding a loved one dead on the floor. Or, you know, you were just telling me a story of somebody who walked into the house and there was a, a robber in the house. Um, people coming in to see dead pets. Um, Something uh, emotionally shocking. Yes, uh, loss of a job, um, a fight with a loved one. You know, we, we've never seen it, I, I think, in our community, but there are always reports of, in certain countries, people dying when their World Cup soccer team lo loses. Yep, and that's spike. probably also an example of so that. There's, it's a, so there's a spike in it then, and there's also a spike in it with earthquakes in Japan. There's lots of studies when there's an earthquake, that emotional stressor um, ha has triggered this quite a bit. And we don't know exactly why, but it's thought that the surge in what we'll call for this discussion adrenaline um, affects certain people's hearts differently than others. And there's something about these people that renders their heart more susceptible to this entity to than, being damaged than, by that. Yeah, than somebody else might be. It's thought that maybe the receptors for this adrenaline um, is, are different on these folks' hearts versus others. but. We don't know exactly, but that's the thought process, that it's something about adrenaline and how one responds to it. But nevertheless, the way this goes is someone walks into a room, they see a loved one dead on the floor, and almost immediately start clutching their chest like they're in the throes of a heart attack. They seek out, you know, 911 is dialed, they get to the emergency room, their electrocardiogram, that's one of the main diagnostic tools, and figure out what's going on, it looks like a typical heart attack that you would see in somebody who has a blocked artery. The immediate thing is done that they bring them to uh, um, what's called the cardiac cath lab, where they do a procedure, angiography, they go up, and everyone's heard of, not everyone, many people have heard of these in catheterization, the catheter goes up to the heart, injects dye. Expecting to find a blockage, right. because that's what we'd expect in a heart attack. Right, absolutely, and, you're, and, and, and everyone in the room, the staff's probably getting ready to get all the equipment ready to go fix a blocked artery, and it turns out that in this condition, the arteries are clean, meaning Beautiful, no blockage, clean. look yeah. like there's no problem going on, and then, as part of the procedure, you can do a test where you can look at the heart's squeezing function. And what you find is that a large segment of the heart, the, almost the entire heart, is virtually motionless. It is stunned, it is not moving at all, and it couldn't be explained by a blockage because it's so many walls of the heart, you'd have to have a simultaneous blockage of all these arteries at the same time to cause that degree of dysfunction. And then the bottom of the heart, or the base of the heart, actually is the one part that doesn't seem to be affected, and it's almost hyper-contractile, squeezing more vigorously. 
but the rest of the heart is really dysfunctional. Um, and people can get really sick with this. So you can't fix an artery, so there's no immediate fix there. And so the treatment is really a lot of supportive care for what we typically give to patients who have a cardiomyopathy, a weakened heart muscle, or in something called cardiogenic shock, where the heart pump's just not pumping well, and your blood pressure's low, and the organs aren't being perfused, and people can get critically ill. People can die from it. More often than not, people don't. People survive. People um, actually, more often than not, recover their heart function completely back to normal weeks, if not uh, months down the road. Uh, but typically, during the acute pro part of this, um, you're treated with supportive care, like I said. So there's certain types of medications. There's a medication called a beta blocker that treats blood pressure, treats heart rate. We think of it as something that keeps sort of the adrenaline down, you know, keeps things down. There's another class of medication called ACE inhibitors, or lisinopril is a common name. We often give that to folks with a weakened heart muscle to decrease the work the heart that, has, that the heart has to do. Um, people often have congestive heart failure as a result of this pump not pumping. They can retain a lot of fluid, so often these patients have to give diuretics. Um, often these patients, their blood pressures are really low, and sometimes they have to get a device in, put in called a balloon pump to help support the, uh, um, the blood pressure, and sometimes uh, there's other sort of medications that one can get to, to help get them through this, this situation. Um, typically, I'd say the first few days are the when people are the sickest and then they start to recover. And like I said before, often if you were to repeat some testing down the road, typically an echocardiogram, that's an ultrasound of the heart, you will often see recovery of the heart function back to the point where it looks like nothing ever happened. Uh, and actually on the EKG, that's the, the first test that was done. There are certain characteristic changes that one can see serially. If you do an EKG each day, there's an evolution of changes that, and to the point where it often just goes right back to normal as if, again, nothing ever happened. Um, what else can we say about it? So people generally do well. Now, what about the emotional stressor and the trigger? Um, you know, there is some discussion about whether these patients should be treated with some sort of anti-anxiety medication and, and things like that. There's no great data to support it one way or the other. I think um, it's a patient-by-patient -patient decision to make. I think more often than not, we keep patients on the long term on a beta blocker medication um, and possibly the ACE inhibitor medication as well, um, if, unless they can't tolerate it for other reasons. But generally speaking, we try to keep people on those medications. Okay. So I think just if I could take a moment just to review you, I think you told us that this is not that uncommon, but it can mimic or be look like a heart attack, mm -hmm. but often is provoked by a particular kind of stressor, like an emotional stress. Uh, patients are more commonly older women, and uh, the treatment for it is supportive medicines to help the heart recover, and almost all the patients do recover. Yeah, many do. And actually, you know, you and I were chatting beforehand. I have certainly a, a decent amount of patients who have had this. Every single one's a female. You mentioned you've only seen one male right. in your experience who's yes. had it. Yes. Um, so I guess that fits with what the typical pattern is. Right. There's one other thing I didn't mention um, from a purely medical standpoint, uh, that when the heart is stunned like it is and not contracting, blood becomes stagnant in the heart and may clot. When blood is stagnant and pools and sits still, it can clot off. And so sometimes people have to go on blood thinners, Coumadin uh, it's called, uh, or Warfarin, um, for a few months as we're waiting for that heart muscle to recover. Um, so that's one other possible treatment arm here. Um, so I find it a, a fascinating thing because just from a, uh, from a physiologic standpoint, a scientific standpoint, and something that we don't fully understand. Um, but I think as we have increased awareness on this, um, that I think we'll learn more and more about what's actually causing it and maybe have some better strategies to prevent it. Although. That might be challenging when you don't know who's going to be susceptible to it. Um, so I think that's really it. I think one of the biggest challenges that I think we always face is the, the, the diagnosis is becoming less difficult because we're all thinking about it, especially in the right patient population. Uh, one of the things that I would add to what you said is that if it's an older woman who doesn't have a lot of risk factors for heart disease, we also are, are more suspicious. So if a patient, say, doesn't smoke, have diabetes, or have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, so they have none of the risk factors for heart artery problems, but they're behaving like a heart attack, that sort of doesn't make sense. So right. it makes us think that that's potentially a cause. So I, I think that that's, that's another issue. Um, but the, one of the big challenges I find is, is the patients who are now doing well two or three or four years later. And there's always a wonder, should we stop the medicine? And if you stop the medicine, then they are susceptible because they're not being protected by those medicines. Right. 
or do you just leave them on low dose? Yeah, I mean, I think there's no right or wrong answer. There's no great data to support it. My personal practice is to, if people are tolerating the medicines, is to try to keep people on it. Similar to when I have patients who have had a cardiomyopathy for other reasons, a weakened heart muscle, and their heart function has improved with the medications, I keep them on those medications and don't remove them. Again, there's no, you know, it's a conversation you have to have with each individual patient. There's no right or wrong answer. Um, but if possible, I try to keep people on the medication, especially the beta blocker in, in this setting. Okay. So you've done a really great job helping us understand, again, this topic called the broken heart syndrome. You told us another name for it is the Japanese term Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Another name for it that doctors sometimes use is called the apical ballooning syndrome, where, as you described, instead of the heart beating all together, part of the heart just doesn't move, so it looks like a big balloon. So that's the idea there. Yeah, stress-induced cardiomyopathy. Or stress-induced cardiomyopathy, yes. So, 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 so I think one of the things that you can always tell about medicine is when we haven't really figured something out, we can't even agree on the name. Yeah. So that's really where we are with this topic. So thank you for a really a fantastic review of a topic that I think is increasingly being recognized, and I think being uh, recognized both by f the physician community, but also by patients as a, an important thing to be mindful of. I think if a, a patient has significant emotional stress and then chest pain, even without uh, symptoms of a heart-related uh, symptoms, I'm sorry, without risk factors for heart artery-related problems, they should seek medical attention because this can really be evaluated pretty quickly and within one or two days, patients could be going home with effective medicines that really almost uniformly recover the patient. As, as Dr. Srivastava said, there's almost no, no patients that don't make a full recovery, especially of the ones that, that come in early. But the ones who, who don't come in uh, may, may be susceptible to other kind of problems like congestive heart failure or heart rhythm abnormalities. So thank you again for joining us on Matters of the Heart here on Haverhill Community Television. I'm Seth Bilizarian from Pentecut Medical, joined by my associate, Dr. Srivastava, finishing up our topic today on the broken heart syndrome. Thanks for joining us.